evolutionary role. And second, he'd already said enough by early 1980 to make clear that he wouldn't think grounding was any good. So we can only t already tell by 1980 he was against grounding. That's my claim. Okay, now I'm going to talk about uh, the, the grounding literature as pro prolifer proliferated. Um, but I'm going to talk about, take two papers which are often taken as seminal. One is by Jonathan Schaffer from 2010, sorry, 2009, and the other is by Gideon Rosen. Um, and th there, is, there's a, there are some other papers which would be worthwhile to consider, but since these two papers explicitly mention Lewis, I'm taking Schaffer <coughs> and Rosen as my conversation partners to discuss what Lewis would have, would have said. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you what Schaffer says about uh, grounding and then say what Lewis would have said in response, and I'll tell you what Rosen says and then what, what, what Lewis would have said in response based upon excerpts from his letters to, to, to some extent. Now, in doing so, I'm going to tell you what Schaffer and Rosen say about the history of philosophy. And when I've talked about this before, people have suggested to me, well, they're not serious, you know, they don't mean to be doing serious history of philosophy, they're just, you know, they're throwing these thoughts in as agents provocateurs to make you rethink about what your assumptions are and so on. Um, maybe that is what they're doing, although they don't give any sign of it. I mean, maybe they are sort of like Rorty, sort of trying to, you know, stir things up, and they're uh, the fifth columnist trying to bring metaphysics down from the inside. But I don't believe that's what they think they're doing. Um, um, I'm pretty certain that's not what they're doing. So I'm going to take seriously what they say about the history of philosophy, because they use the history of philosophy to give support to the claims they want to make about grounding. Okay, so let me, f so stage one, uh, Schaffer's uh, case for grounding. Now, what Schaffer does is he s tells us that we need to embrace grounding because without grounding, we're just in a mess. And the mess we're in is the mess that Quine left us, which is that the, 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 the method for metaphysics that Quine, Quine gives us is simply one of listing entities. All, you, all, all that Quine does to provide us with a metaphysical method is to find out what the ontological commitments of your theory are, and that's basically just to list things. Uh, at, you see it on here. Um, the Quinean task is to is to, is to list the beings. Um, now, he says that he goes on to say that Quine's view deserves praise because it's an integrated conception of the discipline because what you have to do is you have to go and find out what our best theory is and then you look at the ontological commitments of it. Um, and he thinks this was um, helped us revive metaphysics from its positivistic stup stupors um, because the, uh, the positivistic stupors being that before Quine we had Carnap and Carnap told us that metaphysics was mysterious. Nonetheless, uh, so even though Schaffer gives Quine that much praise, he gives us a method and it's better than saying metaphysics is meaningless, he's still a pragmatist anti-metaphysician. So you look at the final quotation from here, the Quine-Carnap debate is an internecine debate between anti-metaphysical pragmatists. Those are his italics, all the, all the italics are his. Yes, those are, those are <laughs> yes. his, his, his Stop italics. shouting, Jonathan. <laughs> um, um, so instead, what should we do? we should embrace Aristotle, or go back to an Aristotelian task, which is to say what ground what. And he appeals to Corkham, who's do, uh, writing about the relationship between dependency claims and Aristotle's works. The philosophical question is not whether things exist, but how they do. So we should go from whether things exist, which is just listing things, to how they exist, which is how things are grounded. So whether to how. He continues to revive the Aristotelian view is thus to further unearth what is already resurfacing to various degrees in Armstrong, Lewis, Fine, and all those who revived traditional metaphysics. So he sees himself as carrying on a debate uh, that uh, has already been, a, a, a tradition that's already there in Lewis. Okay, now, why does he think, why does he think these ideas are already there to be found, albeit submerged beneath the Quinean orthodoxy? Well, he gives uh, uh, a number of reasons. Um, and um, let me just see, I've got them in the right order. Um, yeah, let me, yeah, there are three here. The first is that he thinks you can use uh, grounding ideas to make sense of what Armstrong was on about when Armstrong talked about an ontological free lunch. And an ontological free lunch are those things whose existence supervene upon the existence of other things, and he thought that somehow meant they were no genuine addition of being. Uh, Schaffer suggests you can make sense of that by saying that the ontological free, free lunch is the, the non-fundamental thing, and the thing which isn't free is the fundamental thing, but one grounds the other. 
Uh, his second example is uh, from Lewis. Lewis has a distinguish between more and less natural properties, and in particular believes that there are some base strata of the most natural properties. That's a hierarchy, and according to Schaffer, the best way to make sense of it, as he puts it here in his Aristotelian terms, is to suggest a hierarchical grounding structure. So to make sense of naturalness, we need to have grounding. And then finally, um, uh, we have the claim uh, that uh, philosophers used to, th you know, in the 70s and 80s, began to think, well, reduction doesn't work. We reduction turns out to be much more difficult than people hoped for, so let's have supervenience. So, f so philosophers started claiming that supervenience was the solution to all our problems. But then Kim pointed out that supervenience isn't very explanatory. It just says that one set of properties supervenes upon another set of properties. That's not really explanatory. Just being told the mental supervenes on the physical doesn't give you enough insight. So we need to have grounding as the extra thing. OK, so that's Schaffer's case for why we need grounding. Uh, if we didn't have grounding, we'd just have Quine, and then we'd just be listing entities. Uh, we, we need grounding to make up certain shortfalls, to explain what Armstrong meant, to explain what naturalness means, how it comes in degrees. We need it to explain why the mental is in some sense correlated with the physical in some stronger sense than mere supervenience. Uh, he doesn't offer a definition of what grounding is. I think it's important that it's a primitive for both Schaffer and Rosen. So if, if, you, if you feel cautious about embracing this idea, what he says is this line here, the best advice I can give is to work with the notion and see if you can then come to grasp it. OK. Right, what would Lewis have had to say about this? So I wanted to get Lewis to have a say. Well, uh, in, 18, uh, in 1987, uh, Kim sent a draft of the paper Strong and Global Supervenience Revisited, uh, in which uh, Kim, along with several other papers in, the, in that period, was, was complaining that Davidson appeals to supervenience to make the mental materialistically respectable by saying that the supervenience between the mental and the physical, even though uh, the mental is anomalous. Um, and uh, Kim says that F Lewis, amongst others, um, thinks of supervenience as a kind of determination without reduction. And this is what Lewis says in response. You say that some philosophers have looked to global supervenience as a mode of determination without reduction. For example, those who characterize materialism in terms of global supervenience, e.g. Lewis. But disowning reduction was not part of my aim. So he's not saying that there's, there's no such thing, that, that he's not simply saying there's a brute supervenience claim and there's no connect other intelligible connection between the mental and the physical, so we need to bring along uh, grounding to, to make up the shortfall. He's saying something more than that. And having explained this to Kim, Lewis then characterized it in this uh, other well-known paper, supervenience as a philosophical concept. And here's what he says, having learned the lesson from Lewis explaining it to him. The potential for supplying explanations for, sp for specific supervenience relationships varies for mind-body theorists. Both the behaviorist and the functionalist could formulate a plausible meaning-based explanation. I mean, plausible given their basic doctrines. Pain not itch supervenes on physical condition P because of an analytic semantic connection between pain and the standard expression for P. Do you want to Now, so what's going on here? Well, remember the, uh, well, it's put very, this kind of approach is put very clearly by, um, uh, by Frank in the first couple of chapters of his 98 book. But roughly speaking, we've got a supervenience claim married with a claim about, about conceptual analysis. So physical, the, the, phys the, sorry, the mental supervenes on the physical, that's taken as a, as a datum, but then the explanation of it is that you analyze the mental talk as functional role talk. Roughly speaking, you say there is some thing which plays such and such a causal role with respect to other things. And then the, it supervenes on the physical in the sense that you then say that some physical things fulfill those functional roles, those, 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 those roles which we characterize in mental terms. So the analytic semantic connection, which, which Kim is referring to here, he goes on to explain at greater length in the rest of the paragraph, is basically saying that it's because of the conceptual analysis of our mental discourse in terms of functional roles that you can go beyond the mere supervenience claim to explain why there's an intelligible connection between the mental and the physical. Now, I'm not saying that that works. I have various doubts about it. But that's why he didn't, th that clearly Lewis did not think he, all he had to go on was a brute supervenience claim 
and then we and just left, left things like that. That's certainly what Davidson did, and Davidson couldn't do any more because he said the, me the mental was anomalous with respect to the physical. There was no way of connecting the two in any regular way. But if you can analyze mental discourse in terms of functional role that can, can be have physical realizers, Lewis thought you could have an intelligible connection. So if you look back and you think we need grounding because supervenience was never enough, you're looking back and just looking at Davidson and looking at Kim's Leviathan struggles with Davidson to try and get straight about it. But actually other philosophers were saying more than that about supervenience. Um, there's a little bit more of this in um, the letters to uh, Van Bentham. Um, so Van, Van Bentham was a bit concerned about what he meant by supervenience. He said this, consider a supervenience basis consisting of one dyadic relation, precedence and one monadic property. Consider only the supervenient properties had by whole worlds and consider only those worlds that can be modeled by structures in which precedence is isomorphic to the order of the natural numbers. We have at least as many of these worlds as there are sets of numbers. And so we have at least as many supervenient properties of these worlds as there are sets of sets of numbers. Yet we only have only countably many finite definitions for properties even if we include infinite definitions that manifest finitely specifiable prop patterns. So we have not enough finite definitions to go around. So the great majority of the supervenient properties are not finitely definable. So the, the definitions which he thought that you would need to connect the mental to the physical, if they're anything like, as, if they're at least as complex as the, as, the, as the natural numbers, then those definitions will not be finitely surveyable. So he was willing to embrace uh, the idea that supervenience means infinite def definability, um, even if it's patternless from the fi finite point of view. Um, there's a little bit, if you go down to the next one, um, Kitcher wrote to Lewis in 98, and Kitcher asked uh, what Lewis what he thought about the proliferation of work in uh, the philosophy of science, you know, where people were no longer talking about a, a unified science program that somehow we just had a plurality of different discourses and in various loose relationships to one another. There was, no, there was no, no hope of reducing everything down to physics anymore. And so Lewis went away and he reread re the Oppenheim and Putnam paper, Unity of Science as a Working Hypothesis. And what he does here is he uh, uh, s says that actually, no, he's still in agreement with Oppenheim and Putnam. He still thinks that a unified science program has a hope of working. Um, so he says here, take chemistry and microphysics. Um, can chemistry be reduced to mi microphysics? Well, I take it to be highly probable, a good working hypothesis to say, this, to say the very least, that all chemical properties supervene on arrangements of microphysical properties and that all chemical laws are entailable mi microphysical laws. I also think it's a reasonable expectation in this case that we can discover the physical definition of any chemical property we're likely ever to use a term for. Supervenience covers the case of infinitely complex definability but I doubt if there's that to be expected in the case of chemical properties. I also think it's not a reasonable expectation that we'll deduce very many chemical laws from the microphysical laws that entail them. Mathematical intractability will stop us. I think he must mean something like the argument that he had in the previous letter to Van Bentham. Do I believe in micro-reducibility in this case? I'd offhand say yes, but I can't guess whether what OMP, me, Oppenheim and Putnam mean, to what extent are they betting on humanly feasible derivations? Lewis wasn't betting on humanly uh, feasible der derivations. Okay. Um, now, uh, let's uh, uh, move on to uh, the other claims. In fact, so one of Schaffer's Schaff claim was that supervenience, the problems with supervenience show that we need grounding. I've been arguing that Lewis had supervenience, but he also had conceptual analysis and potentially infinitary de definitions to conduct them. Uh, and so he didn't need grounding. Um, what about the history that says uh, Quine, uh, sorry, that, that, that Lewis uh, started off a new movement in, in metaphysics and, we, and that we need uh, grounding because b when we had Quine, we only had listing? Well, here's um, uh, w one theme of, of uh, Schaffer's history is that Quine was still, a pr was, was still a pragmatist and not really a metaphysician, and that's why we needed Lewis to come along to be a proper metaphysician. That's not how Lewis thought at all. And here are uh, two letters, one to, um, uh, both, actually both to Armstrong. Let me read, let me read the first one. Um, Armstrong uh, thought of Quine as an anti-metaphysician. He thought of, and I think he thought that way because he thought that if you, if you can allow for ideology without ontology, you're not a real metaphysician. Um, and 
Armstrong thought this was a bad influence. Um, here's, here, here's, here's Lewis. First, considering the star of Quine in the ascendant, I don't see Quine as part of a climate altogether hostile to systematic metaphysics. In fact, I see Quine as himself being, among other, other things, a systematic metaphysician, with a, a system in some respects allied and in some respects opposed to Williams. That's DC Williams. This goes far better for 1953 than for later. I'm thinking above all of the Quine of some of the less well-known papers in, from a logical point of view, and not of the Quine of the parts of word and object that argue for indeterminacy of translation and scrutability of reference. When I took and failed my metaphysics exam as a Harvard graduate student in 1963, it was mostly Quine I studied, studied in preparation. Um, certainly that was too narrow a plan of study, but I don't think I was studying the wrong subject altogether. So he clearly disagrees uh, very much with, with the take that Quine uh, wasn't, wasn't, uh, wasn't really a metaphysician. Um, uh, this is a letter talking about the influence of Australian philosophy on him. Yes, I do think that Australian philosophy has given me something in return. Without it, and especially without what I've learned from you, Armstrong, I think I would, for better or I hope worse, by now be different beyond recognition as a philosopher. The Australian influence started years before I ever reached Australia, Jack's seminar, that's Jack Smart's seminar at uh, Harvard in 1963. The influence of Australia and of Donald Williams over a piece, but had it been Williams alone, it might never have taken hold, as it was what I learned from Williams stayed in the compartment for years afterwards. Okay, so I've just... Um, explained why Lewis didn't go along with the history, with the kind of reconstruction of 20th century history of metaphysics uh, that Schaffer describes. Um, let me go into Nick's point, which is that Schaffer thinks that l anyone influenced by Quine who doesn't adopt grounding is just listing entities. Well, one thing that's um, uh, clear is that that wasn't Quine's method. Quine's method uh, wasn't just about listing entities because you can't have ontology without ideology. You can't uh, commit to the existence of something without saying that it's an existence of a thing of a, of a certain kind. Um, uh, as Quine put it, that the lexicon of our theories is where the metaphysical action is, where the primitive predicates occur. And what Lewis appreciated, which Schaffer leaves out, is this ideological aspect, aspect of the primitive predicates, the lexicon of your theory, is the cost and benefits of that pr those primitive predicates that enable you to uh, decide whether one theory is better or worse than another. So, so progress is made in metaphysics by looking to see uh, what the costs and benefits are of the prim primitive predicates of the theory. So it's not just listing entities, it's looking to the ideology and seeing what the costs and benefits of the ideology are. Now as ideas of, about this developed um, uh, in, uh, in various ways through the 70s up until the er early 90s, um, this first quotation, I won't read through all of it, is to uh, Fillmore, who I think is the linguist. Um, he was explaining, at Berkeley at the time, I think, um, he's explaining to uh, uh, Fillmore that there's a difference between uh, predicates which are describe natural properties and those are, which are crazy artificial properties, as he puts it here. Um, and it's interesting that he actually refers to an early paper of Armstrong's from uh, the Munis in 1972, uh, materialism, properties, and predicates for this contrast, although he also mentions that Quine and Putnam have sort of stretched in that direction as well. Um, but at this point, um, he's still willing to uh, suggest the distinction between crazy, artificial, and legitimate properties might just be a psychological matter. He's remaining open-minded. The door has been opened by reading Armstrong's paper from 1972. Um, however, by 1978, he's clearly got hold of the idea that you might simply make the very distinction between artificial and genuine property, a simply a primitive predicate of your theory. And this move is opened up to him by Gary Merrill's response to uh, Putnam's um, uh, internal arguments for internal realism. So Putnam says that you can never, uh, there are just too many, uh, if you want to be a realist, there are just too many ways of interpreting what you say to ascribe your thought a, def a definite content. Uh, Merrill responds by saying, well, not every interpretation is as good as, as another. Some are legitimate. Some of, some of them are just crazy. Mer the suggestion he puts to Merrill here is you just take it as primitive, the distinction between crazy and legitimate properties, or as he later put it, between natural and non-natural property. So here, here he says to, to, to Merrill, I also think it might be okay to simply insist that you do have the distinction between genuine relations and others, and are entitled to use it and say what an admissible interpretation is. So it's just a primitive predicate of your language, and that's the cost of it, but that the benefits of it enable you, are that you enable to refute Putnam's 
uh, absurd consequence that we can't be realists. Now, this view of things was crystallized in uh, you, work the, you Work for a Theory of Universals, um, which is 83, uh, and he talks about various ways in which you can uh, do systematic philosophy. One is that you can simply uh, uh, den deny things as they appear to us, the Murian facts. Another is you can analyze them. And a third is you can just accept things as primitive. If you accept things as primitive, then you have to decide whether or not the costs of accepting those primitives are great enough. Um, um, so, so the, the last two lines, this rival philosophical theories have their prices which we seek measure, um, but it's all too clear that for philosophers at least there ain't no such thing as a free lunch. So you can have your primitives, that's legitimate to do them, they don't need to be grounded in anything. And that's just the end of the story. Um, okay, let's just skip over the letter to field. Um, uh, so th th this issue comes up. Uh, uh, so Lewis wrote, sorry, a after they met, Armstrong wrote four books that Lewis responded to in detail. Um, every time he wrote a long, quite a long letter of sometimes 20 or 30 pages long, uh, the, the thought that Armstrong wasn't really getting hold of the Quine's idea that might, some predicates might be taken as primitive and how you might evaluate their causes of a current theme. Uh, theme of them. Um, here's a, an interesting example. If you look at this a letter to Armstrong, um, this is about the combinatorial theory of possibility manuscript uh, in which uh, Armstrong first began really pushing the truth maker line as the driving force in metaphysics. And uh, Lewis, Lewis was against it. So, um, so here, he, he, I'll, I'll just read you through this. Um, Nobody should deny that some truths, existential and whatever may imply existential truths, require ontological grounds to make them true. So he does allow that you know, if, you, if you buy into that way of talking, then you, existential truths do. No truth maker principle required here. The, the statement in question just is or implies the statement that there are such and suches. And so, of course, there have to be such and suches for it to be true. But not all statements are existential statements. Not all statements are equivalent to existential statements. Not all statements imply existential statements. Negative existentials are the most, are the most striking exception. They say some, there isn't something, not that there is something. The truth maker principle seems to be the thesis that every statement is really an existential statement. And I just don't see why that should be so, any more than I see why every statement should turn out to be really a negative existential statement. So what he's telling us here is that, you know, thinking that every statement requires a truth maker or an ontological ground is a bit like, some, uh, it's a bit like um, Wittgenstein's remark that, uh, we shouldn't think that every word has the same function like every tool in the toolbox has the function of being a hammer. Similarly, we should recognize that there's a plurality of different, func there are different types of functions, different, different types of statements that have different types of function, and not all of them require to be grounded in the existence of something. To think that would be as absurd as thinking that every statement was an existential statement. Um, uh, here, let me quote on this, th this final remark, which is actually from his critical notice of Armstrong and combinatorial possibility. Um, how about predications? They seem for the most part to be true not because of whether things are, but because of how things are. So you can imagine Sh uh, Schaffer liking this remark because this sounds like Aristotle. It's not whether things are, it's how things are. But Lewis continues, even if we grant that ways to be are entities, universals or properties in some, in some other sense, still the predication is true, not in virtue of the mere existent thing in the property, it's just true because the thing instantiates the property. So says the ostrich, why isn't he right? Um, actually, if you look at the, um, uh, yes, if you look at this, this next, uh, this is uh, from some of the letters writing about the draft of Armstrong's World of States of Affairs. Um, so again, the ostrich looms, the, someone who just thinks predication is primitive. Well, I always say an ostrich can be selective. You can be ostrich about the copula, about instantiation, maybe about other relations, but a realist about universals or tropes. It's a, um, then he goes on, I don't see the dishonesty of saying A is just F, and that's all there is to say, any more than saying there's just a state of affairs made of A and F, and that's all there is to say. Describe doubters of the truth maker as dishonest seems merely abusive. What would be dishonest would be to claim the principle yet not apply it to the case of fundamental predications. So he's clear that if you really did believe the truth maker principle, then you really ought to give truth makers to predications. But he himself thinks A is just F, 
And that's all there is to say. It doesn't have a ground. How A is, well, it's F. That's all there, and that's all there is to say in the story ends. OK. Now, the two other reasons that uh, Schaffer gave for thinking that we have to embrace grounding is we can't make sense of the ontological free lunch in Armstrong. Um, well, here's the way that uh, Lewis struggles over how to understand what it means to be ontological free lunch. He doesn't like the sound of it at all. Um, so how does he think you can do it? Um, I submit, he says, that just as Armstrong has an unfamiliar notion of analysis, so he has an unfamiliar notion of ontology. Patrick Quine, his question is not what is there, but rather what does it take to provide truth makers for all the truth, truths? That way it makes perfect sense to say that su supervenient entities add nothing to our ontology. A supervenient entity is still an entity, but is altogether superfluous as a truth maker. So th the way in which Lewis is making sense of Armstrong's ontological free lunch is using Armstrong's notion of a truth maker. Uh, ontological free lunches are those things which don't require an additional truth maker. That's what he means. He doesn't mean there's something, that there are things which are non-fundamental, which are grounded in some fundamental things. We don't need to introduce the, the distinction between fundamental and non-fundamental to understand it. We just need the distinction of those claim, those predications which need their own bespoke truth makers and those whose truth makers are already provided by the truth makers from other, some other predication you've already, you've already installed in your theory. OK, what about naturalness? Well, um, Schaffer's thought is, well, Lewis has a hierarchy of, of natural properties more or less natural properties, don't we need grounding to explain how the natural, less natural ones depend on the more natural ones? Well, the first thing to say is that Lewis didn't have any account of how it was supposed to work. Here's, I mean, this is one nice thing about, about, about Lewis. He often admits that he doesn't have answers or hasn't fully worked things out. In fact, he says he's annoyed by people trying to find system in what he said when it's actually not there. Um, and actually, he says late, in some of his later letters, he actually talks about how he'd rather not have one of his views depend upon the other, any of the others so that people can, I mean, more is likely to survive if the, if the theories are not so finely interwoven that you have to drop the whole lot if you find a fault in one part of it. So roughly speaking, he advoc he's advoc giving disjunctions rather than conjunctions because then what you say is more likely to be true. Anyway, here he is to Paul Teller. Paul Teller suggests that you might have, um, uh, you might not understand imperfect naturalness of some properties in terms of definability from perfectly natural properties. And Lewis says, well, that's fine with me. It makes explicit something I've supposed, but left out because I didn't have details, a theory of simplicity of definitions to offer. And he never comes up with a theory of simplicity of definitions to explain how the natural depends on the less natural. It's just something he doesn't fill out. Now, you might say, well, maybe he would have filled it out, given the notion of grounding in some way that would be congenial to contem some contemporary metaphysicians. Here's my suggestion about what Lewis would have explicitly said to that. Um, so the next... Uh, Another book which Armstrong sent a, ma a manuscript of to Lewis was his Universals and Opinionated Introduction that came out in 89. Um, and in, that, in the opening chapter of that book, uh, sorry, the second chapter of that book, Armstrong asked the question, uh, is an electron, he said, so it's on class nominalism, natural class nominalism. And he asked, is an electron a member of the class of electrons because it's an electron, or is it the, or is it the other way around that's a member of the... Uh, is it, so is an electron because it's a member of the class of electrons, or is it a member of the class of electrons because it's an electron? And he says this is like the Euthyphro question. You know, are the God, is an act pious um, because it's loved by the gods, or do the gods love it because, because it's pious? Um, the Euthyphro contrast is a key element of Schaffer's articulation of what grounding means. He says that it's a key example of, um, and he thinks that many of the questions of contemporary philosophy can be cast as Euthyphro dilemmas. So how did Lewis respond to this passage? Interestingly, Lewis didn't, sorry, Armstrong didn't change this passage in light of what Lewis said next. And it's fact, quite often Armstrong didn't change his views in light of what, what Lewis said. I mean, so I think he did learn a lot from it, but it's interesting that in the various points he just didn't move. Well, what did Lewis say? I think that this saddles the natural cl class anomalous with a commitment he doesn't have. He does say that the electrons are all alike because the class of electrons is natural. He doesn't say there are electrons because they're members of that class or vice versa. In other words, He's just judiciously holding away the question of which grounds what. He doesn't see any reason to go there. It's not, not intellectually fruitful for the class nominalist to take on that distinction and to, 
decide which way he's going to, or which side he's going to take on the Euthyphro contrast. So that, that's my claim that, that Lewis would have withheld from uh, a lot of these grounding claims as simply not being productive. Okay, so that concludes my case against Schaeffer. Um, Rosen, uh, let me quickly, how much time have I got left? Um, 20 minutes. 20 minutes, 20 minutes, okay. Um, okay, so in many respects, Rosen describes a, 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 a different way of going about things to, 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 uh, to Schaeffer, but um, uh, what's, what's key for our purposes is he tells us that the grounding relation is a necessary relation between facts. Um, so let me just take you through a little bit of this and give you some of his uh, uh, some of his symbolism. So here he says the grounding relation is a relation among facts. We say that A is F in virtue of B's being G, but this is shorthand for the claim for the, f the fact that A is F obtains in virtue of or is grounded in the fact that B is G. I shall, shall suppose that facts are structured entities built up from worldly items. So very particularly, facts are worldly entities with worldly constituents arranged in certain ways. They're not, they're, they're not propositions in, certain, in some other sense. And he writes the fact by putting square brackets. So, uh, and then the reverse arrow, uh, so P reverse arrow Q in, is, says the fact that P is grounded in the fact that Q. Okay. Um, now, like Schaffer, he tells us he can't define grounding, but he's going to give us some uh, infer inferential rules for explaining uh, how we should understand it. Um, I haven't got all of them here, but here are, here are some of the more key ones for our purposes. So we've got the entailment principle that says if P is grounded in Q, then Q entails P. So the facts that ground P together ensure as a matter of metaphys metaphysical necessity that P obtains. So uh, that's important for us because it's telling that if one thing grounds another, then it's necessary. Th then it's a necessary connection between those two facts. So entailment guarantees that necessarily, if one occurs, one obtains, the other obtains. So the grounding relation has to be necessary. Um, so, this, so those are the two most important facts. But so two key points here. One is that grounding is a relation between facts, and it's, it obtains where it does necessarily. He goes on to talk about a variety of other grounds. Um, he's got a natural necessity, um, so that uh, it can be, it might be a, a necessary fact that everything, sorry, if it's a strong law that everything is F, that grounds the fact that everything is F. Um, similarly, accidental regularities, he thinks they're grounded in what Armstrong called totality facts. Um, the reason why an accidental regularity requires a totality fact to ground it is a reflection which uh, he get, uh, Armstrong got from Russell, which is that if you want to say A, B, and C are all the things there are, it's not enough to just list each of them and say, because you don't know that there's not some other thing D waiting in the wings. So we've got to exclude anything else. So what you have to write is uh, an existential univer an ex uh, a universal claim uh, if you want to say that these are all the things, or everything is F, what you need to say is for all X, uh, if X equals A or X equals B and so on, and then each of those things is F. So, um, uh, what we end up with here is, uh, so he says that, uh, it, we might say that when um, uh, everything is F is an accidental regularity, it's always grounded at least in the following way, Namely, there's a totality fact that those are all the things and they are F. Um, okay, next one, grounding of modal truths for it to be necessary that P is for there to be some things such that P holds in virtue of the nature of those things. Um, so roughly speaking, it's, in the, it's the essences of things that determine what's necessary. And here's a particular case which will be important for us. He thinks that... Uh, things being determinably a certain way is, is grounded in there being determinately a certain kind of way. Um, so what it is, so here he introduces, uh, so first he tells us that um, if G is a determinant of the determinable F and A is G, then the fact that A is determinably F is grounded in its being determinately G. Um, and how do we get behind, what, what explains that grounding claim, what grounds the grounding? 
Well, it's because what it is to be a determinable is to be for there to be such that a determinant of the right kind holds of the thing which satisfies the determinable. So to be blue is to instantiate some shade of blue. Well, I, I said earlier that Rosen, uh, sh both Rosen and Schaffer make historical claims to make their views seem more plausible. Here's Rosen's claim. Um, so let me read you through this quotation, which is quite important. Perhaps the best reason for resisting the gradient grounding idiom is the suspicion that despite its, su its superficial intelligibility, the notion is ultimately confused or incoherent. To say that the notion is confused is to say there are several distinct relations of grounding or dependence in the vicinity, and the uncritical invocation of the grounding idiom conflates them. To say that this notion is incoherent is to say that every effort to set out the principle that governs it ultimately leads to absurdity or incoherence. This was the burden of Quine's critique of the modal idiom, as I understand it, and we cannot rule out the possibility that something similar might happen here. So he makes it sound as though it's some far-fetched, some relatively remote possibility that someone might come along and do what Quine failed to do for, for modality and do it for grounding. Um, the reason this, the, the, this rhetoric, is his, I think, is historically wrong is that while some of Quine's early attacks on, 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 on modal logic turned out to not work, they had various te technical failings with them and they, were, they weren't precise enough in various respects and Ruth Marcus played a big role in pointing that out. Where Quine eventually ended up was he actually thought that the, no the modal notions were too context rel relative and malleable to actually have to play a fundamental role in science. Now, that's exactly what Lewis thought as well. Uh, this is what Lewis calls modal inconstancy in the plurality of worlds. So Rosen makes it sound as though no one's thought this since the 1930s when Quine was saying some mistaken things about, about, about modality. But in actual fact, the, the, the underlying problem that Quine had with modality is reflected in Lewis's writings. And some of Lewis's reasons for rejecting modality as being fundamental, namely the modal inconstancy, reflect back on why he wouldn't have liked the grounding idiom as it's used by, used by, um, uh, by Rosen. OK, so uh, the 1978 book by Armstrong, Universals and Scientific Realism and Universals, is that way around it is? Um, um, he, hadn't, uh, he didn't read it before he came out, but he wrote a long, le long letters to Lewis about it um, after um, um, sorry, Armstrong Lewis wrote to Armstrong about it after he'd read the book. And um, what he does here is he offers an objection to uh, um, the theory of laws that he found in Armstrong. Now, the theory of laws that uh, Armstrong offered in his 78 book and every other subsequent book was basically the theory of laws which is, is used as, uh, it, it is appealed to by Rosen in his account of strong laws. Um, so I garbled that a bit. Basically, grounding is already there in Armstrong. Basically, he, Lewis, sorry, Armstrong wants to ground facts about the extensions of, of universals in terms of higher order relations bet between the properties that are involved. Maybe it's easier to draw this. Um, so suppose we've got a very simple law that says uh, 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 Every f is a g, something, something along those lines. According to Armstrong, the reason that happens is because, I, is because there's a relation of gnomic necessitation between the two universals. Um, just, to, just, to, just to go quickly, Armstrong's problem, Lewis's problem was, well, why does this higher order relation between these two things mean that down here, let's um, have some particular examples. Suppose we've got. Um, a, individual A, um, why should the fact that this state of affairs here, call it S1, give rise to these two states of affairs down here, S2 and S3? They're distinct states of affairs. Why should this one give rise to these two? Armstrong said, well, that's just what necessitation does. It's what it is to be the necessitating relation that it has this consequence. And, and you work for three of universals, Lewis responded by saying, well, just because you call it necessitation, because you say that's what it is, that doesn't explain how it does it. 
that just leaves it open. That's like saying just because you're called Armstrong that you have mighty biceps. That was his famous quip. Now, um, this is the first version of the mi mighty bicep objection here. Um, so, uh, okay. Um, can you go the, so, you so, so here he says, you call the lawmaking re relation necessitation. I'll just call it so Solon. That's meant to be a near mere name um, without descriptive content. Maybe there's another relation between universals, the relation of constant conjunction, whether lawful or accidental. I name it constants. So necessarily, um, uh, all A's or B's, if and only if A bears the relation constants to B. Right? Um, so roughly speaking, we've got Solon up here, um, relating F and G, and we've got constants down here, relating F and G. So this is just regularity. This is the, the law-like state that induces the regularity. Um, right, now. Um, okay, so you can't, if you thought constants was the law-making relation, you'd be a regularity thesis. So you can't say these are the same thing, because then you'd just be a regularity thesis. So, so you're not, but he's not. Um, so he must be committed to the truth of the star. Can you highlight the star? For any universals A and B, if A bears so long to B, that then also A bears constants to B. But what is the status of star? I'll be glad of your answer. Um, and basically he goes on to say, well, how, how can it be? It has to be logically necessary. Um, 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 so he says, if star is necessary in the strictures, logical or absolute necessary, how can it be? A is bearing so long to B and A is bearing so long to B look like two different states of affairs of which one could occur without the other, distinct existences. Um, he considers the possibility, perhaps, solo and constants are not the same, but one's part of the other, but then you've got the leftover parts, and they need to be necessarily connected, so there's no, no way out there. Um, then he says, he explains why he called this one solo and this one constants. It's because we, we usually give these things names that tells us what they're, what, they're, what they're supposed to do for us. And then because we've given them that name, we think they do do it for us, and there's nothing more to explain. But if you give them just names without descriptive content, you're more able to see there's been a sleight of hand here. So the most general criticism I can imagine Lewis coming forward with regard to uh, theories like Rosen's, Rosen keeps saying, well, what it is to be a de determinable, or what it is to be a law is that has these consequences. And Lewis, I think, will just keep saying, well, you say that's what it is, but all you've done is you've explained what descriptive name you give to a thing, but you didn't give any explanation of how it can satisfy that description. Um, okay, so there's various other interesting points in that letter, but we can come back to it if you like. Um, there was a response where, um, uh, um, yes, rough, uh, I won't take you through this, but basically speaking, um, Armstrong considers the possibility of the relationship between these things might, might be the relation between conjunctions and a conjunct or disjunctions and a disjunct. Um, and so, you, you, so, for example, you might say the entailment between something being F and G, G to, <coughs> to its being G is fine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you might say that's fine, or you might say the inference between um, being G to being F or G is fine too. Um, but that's not what's happening in these kinds of cases. And indeed, if you go back to... Um, uh, the particular case of um, uh, with, with with Rosen, I'm sorry, you don't need to go back. Okay. Um, um, if you look on the handout, um, this this he very explicitly says that um, he very explicitly says that um, you can't think of as a t determinable as a simply a conjunction or a disjunction of determinants. Sorry, a disjunction of determinants. And the reason you can't is that you wouldn't be able to learn what the determinable meant because you'd have to unpack all these infinitely many disjuncts. So. So, so, so these, these what it is definitions of things, which are meant to be real definitions in the world, they're not, they, have to be, they have to be finite to be humanly graspable. So they're not going to fall into this pattern which Lewis thinks is intelligible. So all that's left behind are unintelligible necessary connections. But by sleight of hand, we don't see that they're unintelligible because we give them names that give them a spurious intelligibility. 
And that will happen with all the cases that, that of structural universals and totality facts of possible worlds as abstract symbols. I mean, this, uh, for those of you who know more about this, you, you, you find a similar um, relationship with, um, uh, you find a sim sim similar relationship with um, uh, um, magical or Zatzism. Um, let me put two final thoughts, so it's a bit of a rush. Let me give you two, two final thoughts. I said, so the, the basic form of Lewis's, of Rosen's theory is that grounding is a necessary relation between the facts. Lewis, we've just seen, doesn't like necessary connections between distinct facts. So he isn't going to like grounding if it's a necessary relation between facts. But he doesn't even like the notion of fact because he thinks the notion of fact brings along necessary connections with it. Um, so can you find the... Uh, so, um, so something which occurs again and again in, in his discussions with, with, with Armstrong is um, uh, you can't think of the fact that A or B as just being the sum of A or B because suppose R is an asymmetric relation. Uh, the fact that A or B is incompatible with B or A, but they're made up out of the same constituents. So this showed to Lewis that these are, these are this is a this is a kind of uh, th these can't be mirrorologically composed. So states of affairs don't have mirrorological composition. So this thing here does not have A as a part. So this argument I've just been through that these are in common to these two things. So these cannot be simply sums of these two things. Shows that A is not a part of A or B. So let's just call it alpha. A is not in it, it's just something, it's this mirrorological simple, it's not composed of anything, it's a mirrorological simple. Nonetheless, necessarily, if alpha exists, then A exists. And Lewis says that's absurd. You don't notice it's absurd because you give alpha a name that covers up the difficulty of understanding the connection. You call it the fact that A or B, which makes it seem inevitable that A will be present. But in fact, you're not entitled to make that assumption. You've no idea of how alpha could deserve the name A or B, given that by, uh, by the argument we've already established that A is not a part of A or B. So there's an, the f notion of fact itself is, uh, goes against his denial of necessary connections between distinct existences. A is not a part of alpha, nevertheless alpha necessitates A. And so he rejects it. So facts don't exist for Armstrong, and therefore he can't... Um, yes. For, 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 for Lewis, and therefore he can't, um, uh, okay, uh, can't acknowledge any of this. Right. Nonetheless, L L Lewis was also good at pointing out where there were exceptions to the uh, to his to his view. So I really want this is his last point, Thomas. Um, um, and you can see it here in this letter to Armstrong in eighty seven. Um, can you highlight that paragraph there? Um, and the problem is that. Uh, Lewis admitted that if you have A, then you have the singleton of A. And he thought that was necessary, even though they're distinct. Um, again, A can't, isn't a part of the singleton, because the single, um, but nonetheless, if you have A, then you have the singleton, it's the singleton of it. So he thought that, so, so he said to, he said to Van in Wagen, um, uh, Here's a case where I've got to, I can't get away from the need for singletons, but we have a necessary connection. So at least here I have to give in to the big necessary connection between distinct existences. So, Do you want to go on to after what you're doing? Um, the, the final stage in the story, which is I'll, I'll just mention, is that what happens in the appendix to parts of classes is he finds a way out of this. What he, he manages to do in parts of classes, which I don't think he was completely clear about. Uh, uh, at the, at the, at the, till the very end uh, in his paper Mathematics as Megathology from 93 um, is that he's got a way of explaining away Singleton. So uh, one way to deal with necessary connections is somehow to make them palatable by showing they're not really connections between distinct things after all. Another way of dealing with them is to say they're not really there at all. And in effect what he provides in, in the appendix to parts of classes is a reduction of set theory so that sets disappear that really there are just sums and complicated ways of talking about sums and an awful lot of atoms. <laughs>
So here he is uh, writing to Van Inwagen in, in, in 1990, just before parts of classes came out. Yes, we can have a version of set theory whose primitive vocabulary is that of a plural quantificational extension of first order logic plus is a part of. At present, the co-authored appendix of how it's done has been approved by only three of its four co-authors. Quine was going to be one of the co-authors, but Quine backed out because he thought he didn't, he, the other authors ought to get more credit for it than, than he did. Um, so I hope so it's soon. You could try a two cochrane either on the apparatus of plural quantification or on the apparatus of Mariology, because that's all there is now. There's plural quantification of Mariology. If you did, I couldn't answer as before. To write it's mysterious, but it's the only given time. Because as you know, I think plurals and Mariology, sorry, uh, are unproblematic and perfectly understood. I also think in both cases we have something very close to identity. The plural copularities, one of them is like an infinite disjunction of identities. Composition into dominant final form, I take to be many one or other. Um, so if you could run a two copy against either the plural copular or composition, I expect you could run it against identity itself. So he thinks that he can provide, megathology, which is the combination of plural quantification plus Mariology, allows you to model set theory involving these very, these ingenious and complicated translations of Hazen and Burgess and, and Quine. Um, and so to undermine what he's saying there, you would actually have to undermine Mariology and pl pl plurals. He thinks that it, what he's suggesting here is that if you could undermine those, you could undermine identity itself. Um, of course, our, uh, Van Inbagen wrote a paper saying the connection between composition and identity is much looser than you think. Um, and people have then have written scholarly papers on exactly what the, Lewis took himself to mean when he said composition is like identity. Um, some people think he meant it really is identity and other people think he, he took it as a looser relation. Um, here's what he wrote back to Van Inwagen and I'll stop. Nothing to take seriously within composition identity, Van Inwagen's paper. After all, I also say the analogy is only analogy. It has its limits. Uh, and two rests to a substantial extent on premises that for some instance some, for instance, you would controvert. So once again, we get him judiciously admitting that other people don't accept the premises that he does. Okay, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you.